In this case study, we're going to present a design of a wideband amplifier that does not rely on matching networks. Instead, it uses a number of transistors, and here we've got six transistors shown, and it builds these transistors into a transmission line. So the problem addressed by this particular type of design is how do we design a multi-octave wideband amplifier? If we are designing an amplifier that has a bandwidth of about half an octave, we can use a traditional matching network style design, but half an octave is about as much bandwidth as we can possibly achieve. But sometimes we really do need to have wider bandwidth, a multi-octave bandwidth. And the design that we're going to investigate here is a 2 to 18 gigahertz design. Produces around about half a watt. It is fairly low efficiency, unfortunately, but that's what comes with the wide bandwidth that we're trying to achieve. The type of applications where we need this incredibly wide bandwidth are in instrumentation. Usually we want our instruments to have very wide bandwidth because we don't quite know where we want to use them. We also need wide bandwidth when we're distributing the signal. And instead of having multiple individual amplifiers, we would have one wideband amplifier. The military, of course, is very interested in very wide bandwidth because they often do not know where the signals will be that they're trying to intercept or view. Typical electronic warfare application is to have a 2 to 18 gigahertz amplifier. So we have a receiver, we're trying to look at signals or we're looking at the spectrum over a very wide bandwidth and we want to see what is out there. We need a very wide bandwidth if we're trying to drive an optical source to be used in an optical communication signal. If we want to produce an optical signal with 20 gigabits per second or 40 gigabits per second, we need to provide a driver that operates from a very low frequency, maybe 1 or 2 gigahertz, up to the 10 gigahertz or 20 gigahertz or even 40 gigahertz. Now when we're designing something to have a very wide band, we want to have a slightly positive gain slope because all of the passive components that we're going to deal with are probably going to have an insertion loss that slightly increases with frequency. And again, we don't get anything for nothing. We must put up with fairly low efficiency and fairly low gain. Let's review the single stage wideband amplifier dilemma. Our classic approach is to consider that we have a transistor, we view it as a two port, and we have an input matching network that achieves essentially maximum power transfer and an output matching network which is usually designed to achieve matching power transfer at the output. The input network may only come close to that because it may be adjusted to optimize noise performance and perhaps also to adjust for stability concerns. Our transistor is shown here as a MESFET and that's, that is the transistor we're going to consider in this case study. And the essential input of the transistor looks like a capacitor in parallel with a resistor. There's my attempt at drawing a resistor. At the output we also have a capacitance. So the main function of our matching network for either maximum power transfer and for matching over a fairly wide band is to try and cancel out that input capacitance and the output capacitance. And so if we just look at the input matching problem, we see that what we really would like to have at the input network is a negative capacitance to cancel the capacitance looking into our transistor. At the output, we'd also like a negative capacitance to cancel the output capacitance. And sometimes we would like to have a negative inductance to cancel out perhaps a bond wire inductance, or it could be an inductance due to a length of transmission line at the output of our transistor. It is quite a problem to design a circuit that effectively presents a negative capacitance. Of course, negative capacitors don't exist. And so our design problem is then to develop a matching network, or I should say, 
that if our design approach is to use input and output matching networks, the design problem is to come up with a matching network that essentially presents something like a negative capacitance. But about the best that we can do is to achieve something like that over half an octave bandwidth. So we need another strategy for designing wideband amplifiers if we need a bandwidth more than half an octave. And this is the strategy. The strategy is to consider our transistor as being part of transmission lines. So we regard our input of the transistors, which is essentially the gate source capacitance, as being an auxiliary capacitance in the transmission line model. Here we have a four-stage design and we're augmenting the capacitance of the line with the gate source capacitance. And so we're not going to design a very good transmission line because of course we'd need more sections than that. But this is the concept. We repeat this concept for the drain line as well. So we now have artificial transmission lines at the gate, forming the gate line, and an artificial transmission line forming the drain line. Of course, there are very many parameters here. If we try to simplify things by keeping all the transistors the same, we will need, ideally, to change the characteristic impedance of each of those transmission line sections, and we would want to change the length of each of the transmission lines. We also may want to change the bias on the transistors. Well, clearly here, we're up to a very large number of parameters. There's no way we can use a CAD tool to optimize the design. So we need to have a strategy to break down the design. And the strategy is, or one of the possible strategies is, to just consider the gate line on its own. That reduces the number of parameters, but we still have to do some simplifying work to be able to even design that. And then we can consider the drain line. Let's move on to the case study that we're going to consider. The case study is a 2 to 18 gigahertz amplifier. The design uses six MOSFETs as shown there. And to simplify things, we're going to make all of these MOSFETs the same. These MOSFETs have a gate length of 0 0.5 microns. And that's a fairly magic number when it comes to compound semiconductors because we can realize a 0 0.5 micron gate length transistor using optical lithography. If we wanted a smaller gate length than that, we would have to use a much more expensive electron beam process. Now the idea here is that we have an RF input and we want the signal to travel from left to right and finally, we're going to terminate the circuit in a resistor. This element shown here could be a lossy length of line forming our resistor. We may rely on the gate resistance as well. And here, we must apply bias. So what do we have to consider? Well, we want a forward traveling wave, and we do not want a backward traveling wave. To achieve that, we must design the artificial transmission line, that is our transmission line that is augmented by the gate source capacitance, so that it has a constant characteristic impedance. Other considerations are that we must get bias into our individual FETs. We get the bias in through this resistor, and we need a capacitance here that essentially looks like an RF short circuit. We have similar concerns at the output. We want a wave that travels from left to right to the RF output. Now consider this. When our signal is following this path, our RF signal goes into the gate, it's amplified, and when it comes up here, a portion of our signal will want to travel to the right, and a portion of our signal will want to follow to the left. When we get to FET2, we'll see that we have a portion of the signal that wants to go to the left, a portion of the signal wants to go to the right. 
and we want to adjust the length of this transmission line so that these two portions of signal that want to flow to the left cancel each other out. So in a way we're designing a directional coupler, an active directional coupler at that. It is difficult to achieve what I've just stated perfectly, but we can get reasonably close. Here is the layout of our mimic. As we move our signal along the gate line, it'll tend to get smaller and smaller as we go from left to right. And the signal on the drain line will grow as we move from left to right. Now consider the gate line. We have an RF input, which is going from left to right. And here we have a long length of line, which is acting as our wideband termination. We also have a resistor that connects to the gate. And that resistor also provides a resistive termination. Because of course, after we've gone from left to right, from the first transistor to the second, all the way to the sixth transistor, there will still be a signal and we must absorb that signal. We cannot afford that signal to reflect back. So the gate termination resistor will provide some termination, but just to be sure, we're going to have a long length of microstrip line in this case, and it's going to absorb some of our signal. On the drain line, ideally, our signal is growing along this path from left to right. But of course, there will be some signal that travels to the left. We will not cancel out that signal completely. Any signal that appears at FET1 and it is propagating from right to left, we want it to come up here and be absorbed in a drain termination resistor. And just to make sure that we are doing a good job, we'll have a long length of microstrip line. So that is the concept. Let's look at the performance now. Let's focus on the measured performance shown in red. At the top is the measured output power. And the measured output power for most of the band from 2 to 18 gigahertz is more than 26 dBm. It's a little bit less when we get up to 18 gigahertz. So we do have an output power which is typically more than 25.5 dBm. The bottom set of curves show the gain. The measured gain increases slightly with frequency. Now this quasi-periodic variation that we see is a typical response we will see from a transmission line system. So that's an indication that we have not built our transmission line perfectly. We do seem to have a slight standing wave on our transmission lines. The next result we will look at is the power added efficiency. The power added efficiency typically jumps around a lot more than the gain or the power. But our efficiency, you will see, is around about 10% over this bandwidth. And that is a very low efficiency. For the half octave wideband amplifier designs, the designs that use input and output matching network designs, or I should say, uses classical input and output matching network designs, we could expect efficiencies of around about 50%. So the big drawback for a wideband amplifier is this low efficiency. One of the reasons we do not see them in cell phones, and we only see them where there really is no choice. But even in some wideband operations, we will see multiple half octave wide amplifiers that are cascaded together. So it is not easy to design these amplifiers. It takes lots of skill and experience. One of the tools that helps us understand what is going on is to look at what are called the dynamic load lines. These are things that we cannot see in the lab. We cannot measure them. But with CAD tools, we can create these load lines. Now, I am showing six load lines here, one for each FET. We go from FET1 to FET2 up to FET6. And there is a lot of information in here that a designer can use. 
Now the principal variation here is that at FET1 we have a fairly open loop and it is not covering the entire IV space. By the time we get to FET6 we see that the loop is closed but now we are covering a very large part of the current voltage characteristic. So I'm going to focus on FET1 and FET6. On the left here is the dynamic load line for FET1. These amplifiers are designed as Class A amplifiers, so there will be a straight line DC load line. This open, fairly symmetric loop is telling us that our FET is seeing a parasitic load. So it is not seeing a resistive load. If we had built a perfect active directional coupler, each of our FETs would see a resistive load. But FET1 is seeing an open loop, which is telling us that it's seeing a capacitance. And that loop is fairly symmetrical and fairly smooth, so we know there's not much harmonic content there. But when we move to FET6, and that is where the signal on the drain line is the maximum, at FET6 we want the greatest efficiency. The parasitics that we see in FET1, that is, the parasitics at the drain that we're seeing in FET1, result in the transistor consuming more power than we really want it to do. By the time we get to FET6, where our signal is large, we want to be in a condition of maximum power transfer. We want our dynamic load line to be as close as possible to our DC load line, and that is what we see. And so when we're doing design and we're tweaking some of the characteristic impedance and line lengths, and at the final stages of design will be with the drain, we will be trying to close off the loops so that we're sitting on a straight line. Our desire for maximum efficiency also drives us to try and cover as much of the current voltage characteristic as possible. And this region here, this region at low voltage, where we are clearly departing from a straight line, is telling us that there's significant harmonic content at FET6. If we just go back one slide, what we are seeing is a fairly open loop for FET1. We have a strong parasitic capacitance, so the efficiency is not so great. FET2, well, again, we have a parasitic effect. FET3 here, we're starting to close the loop because we're starting to want higher efficiency. FET4, we've pretty much got the same type of loop, but now we're covering more of the IV space. FET6, well, we're covering a tiny bit more of the IV space. FET6, that's where we want the maximum efficiency. So let's summarize where we are. Designing a distributed amplifier takes considerable skill. There are many algorithms that have been developed, and many of them have been published in papers, and I imagine some have been kept internal. 